who am I? So what's my function? My name is Matthias Walter. I'm a mechanical engineer. So um, I also sort of an apprenticeship as a precision mechanic. So I'm a craftsman also originally. Um, at Medartis, I used to serve the function as a um, design engineer. So I designed some of the products, mainly the upper extremity products, hand and distal radius. Amongst those are also those technologies like um, Trilog, for instance, um, the idea of um, obviously having a friction locking construct that is reversible and so forth. So this was in the very early days of Medartis. Now in the meantime, I've moved now into a sort of more of an education position. So my job is it actually, well, to entertain people and to tell them a little bit about sort of the mysterious sides of mechanics and um, how this all coincides and connects um, with biology. Right. Now, topic today that I have chosen is as strong as necessary and as weak as possible. Now we refer to this as sort of the golden rule of mechanics and I would just like to shed a little bit of light to uh, the golden rules of these uh, mechanics in osteosynthesis. This is going to be subdivided in two sessions. So we're going to have a session today and uh, there will be a second session actually. This is then um, biomechanics 2 that will be held in exactly one week's time from now on the 5th of May. So if you like the first part, maybe you're also willing and happy to join me in the second next week. Right. And with this, I would just like to kick it off. Um, who are we, first of all? Who is Medartis? I would think the majority of people who actually joined in already know who we are and what we do, but still to put us all on the same page. Um, who are we? We are Precision in Fixation. Medartis is a company actually that's specialized in um, sort of technical high precision implants in all fields. This can be cranium axillofacial, hand, radius, elbow, and so forth. So bone repair, if it's fractures, if it's osteotomies, we're headquartered in Basel in Switzerland. And this is also where we produce all our products. And this is pretty much where everything comes from. Now, what's the aim now of this session? Um, to be honest with you, the idea was not to use this more or less as an, well, how can I phrase this? Um, as a marketing kind of instrument. So I don't like the idea of using this kind of channel of selling you the product because for that, we obviously we have our sales reps out in the field. If you need to know more specific information about the product, about the system, etc., this is all stuff that you can find on the internet. You don't need me for that. We have a homepage at artist.com where this is all explained. We have very professional people out there are always very willing to help you when it comes to choosing the right implant. So, and here, that's why I want to really uh, reduce this to all those aspects that you simply cannot find in a normal med artist brochure. Um, I would like to talk mainly medical engineering, so not that much really um, sort of med medicine as such. I'm not a surgeon, I'm a mechanical engineer. That's why I would love to just reduce this to the engineering part of everything. Um, I would love you to create a certain understanding for the challenges that we as manufacturers and designers usually have when designing a new product. I would love to let you participate, obviously, in the decision-making process of what makes a good implant design. Um, learn to differentiate, and this now comes the fun part, actually learn to differentiate the good, the bad, and the ugly, all right? Because usually people are under the impression that plate is a plate is a plate, the screw is a screw is a screw, it's all the same, and it is not. There are detailed differences, and those detailed differences make the big difference when it comes to not just implantation, but also when it comes to the performance inside of a patient, when it comes to post-operative training, etc. All those things play a relevant role. And I would just like, like to point out certain things that may help you, obviously, create your own little sort of quality kind of vision. Right, and last but not least, stability is not everything. Less is sometimes more. Um, so therefore, not everything that is ultimately strong is necessarily super or great. It can be exactly the opposite. And those are the things I would love to concentrate on. Now, agenda-wise, I would have loved to kick the whole thing off with an introduction video. Having said that, 
Um, having said that, some, someone's got the microphone. Oh, thank you very much. Um, uh, so I would have loved to start with the the introduction, the introduction video. However, due to the bandwidth problem that we have at the moment, it's actually not a smooth flow running video. That's why Alexander and I, who is actually accompanying me here, um, we decided actually not to show the video. It's just sort of an image video of MedArtis. It's something that you can actually watch directly on our homepage. And it's just a nuisance actually watching it here in this in this kind of surrounding. So next topic from there is then bone function and stresses. So what's the bone actually doing? What kind of stresses is it subjected to? And so forth. When it comes to a fracture, how do we repair bone? So osteosynthesis in general, how does it work? How is it done? How, you, how was it done in the past? Then I will talk about stability and stiffness. So where's the connection there? So ultimate strength, sort of necessary strength, all those things. And in this session, I would like to finish off the whole thing uh, with the material choice. Why Medartis has actually chosen titanium as an implant material and not stainless steel, for instance, or vitalium. So why are we so much convinced that titanium for our purposes is the right material and state-of-the-art material to use? Right. Now, after the session, and I hope this will be done in about 45 minutes, um, after the session, you will have the possibility to certainly ask questions to me. Um, so therefore, you will find in your status bar, you will find the participant icon. So if you click this, uh, all participants will appear. So uh, I guess then you just click on your own name, then you raise your hand, and Alexander, who is actually the host, will then unmute your microphone and you can then ask me the question directly. You also have the possibility, I think, to um, also raise a question in a chat field so you can write a message. Alexander will actually sort of put this down and I can then obviously answer this either straight away or I just continue and answer the question then right at the end of the session. Okay, happy with that? Good. So what's our skeleton actually doing? Our skeleton, as you all know, is support against gravity. So it's the vehicle for movement. It's the supporting structure. It's the safety mechanism to make sure that our internal organs actually stay safe due to the rib cage, etc. That's what a skeleton does. We have an endoskeleton, obviously like an insect. So therefore, this is our supporting structure that we carry inside. Now, as life is motion, we all know this. These are just a few images, actually, of a few sports that you can perform if you want and if you're courageous enough to do so. Um, only This is only possible if you have, uh, if your movements can actually be performed in a more or less natural manner. If you, and you all know this, if you have your favorite sports um, and say, for instance, I would tell you tomorrow, look, mate, you cannot actually do your sports anymore because your hand is disabled because it's actually completely crooked in position. So you're not allowed to play tennis anymore. Maybe I would definitely sort of change the quality of life that you have. So therefore, coming back to, a, to an anatomical correct function is always paramount to everything that we do. And when we look at the function of a skeleton, you will find, mechanically speaking, this is we are pivoting gears. So we're made up of sticks or beams, and those beams actually rotate around sort of given points in space three-dimensionally. Now, as every human being is different, we all have sort of different three-dimensional positions of our various joint lines and joint positions. And only when they are brought back into their original position, only then we can actually talk about a functional anatomy. <clears throat> a geometrical aspect of functional bone is obviously, as I mentioned, the bone is a beam or a stick with joints on either end, distal as well as proximally. Now, for a correct anatomical function, these joints, as mentioned, need to be in those predetermined three-dimensional positions. Otherwise, you have a very limited function or even no function. Now, this means that the length relative from one joint to the other, the length, the angle, the rotation, but also the axis 
actually plays now a vital role when it comes to correct function of a limb. And uh, that's why those things under all circumstances need to be um, sort of found again after bone repair. Now, as long as we're in equilibrium, everything works pretty fine. So you usually have your center of gravity, if you have your body weight, if you run, if you jog, if you do whatever, you have obviously the same amount of force that the floor actually has to create in order to support you from underneath. So as long as the formula action equals reaction actually applies, you will actually find that wherever you have a joint, your action force creates a reaction force on the opposite side. This then travels across the length of the bone and acts again as an action force, which has a reaction force um, in, as a result. Now, functionally speaking, and this Vitruvian man, you know, from Leonardo da Vinci, um, actually shows us pretty much sort of the ratio length, height, width, etc. We only work functionally if everything is actually measured correctly. As soon though, as one of the limbs actually break and we create, if you want, an artificial kind of joint, then suddenly our ratios are not correct anymore, which has a drastic effect. Now, some of you may have seen this little YouTube video that I uploaded here. I hope you can see this well, all right? I hope we haven't got the bandwidth problem. So what's now the effect when a bone breaks? Just to quickly tell you what's happening, although this is a slow motion movie, um, I need to explain quickly what's what's happening. You see those two kickboxes. Now the white bloke is actually kicking the femur of the dark-skinned guy. And uh, since he must have sort of pre-fractured somehow his, uh, his lower leg, something will happen now. So it will create now um, a fracture. And this fracture will actually show you now the effect when a bone potentially breaks. Now just watch this. So kick, break, and now the lower limb has completely lost its function. So therefore, the overload has actually created destruction and this destruction momentum now disables the supporting function of the bone. So in other words, this guy simply cannot stand anymore because he has now a joint where there never was a joint before, all right? So overload leads to destruction, function is not given. And in order now to understand the sort of the idea of, um, of fractures, we need to understand the nature of bone. Bone is a viscoelastic material. So it's not, it's not a homogeneous material. It's not like a piece of steel or a piece of wood or any, any other kind of dead substance, if you like. Bone is a viscoelastic material. So it's an actual fact, a little bit like sort of something that, um, that has a certain, a certain behavior. And um, especially when you apply the force slowly or when you apply the force very quickly. So therefore fracture pattern depends very much, not just on the magnitude of the impact, but also on the speed. Now we have to therefore distinguish between those high velocity kind of accidents, high energy accidents, or sort of load to failure accidents that you also may find. Now in bone, and this is just the nature of the material, sudden application of load, so high energy impact will show a different fracture pattern, simply because the energy cannot be absorbed fast enough compared to slow application of the load. And this is, this is important to understand, right? Because um, the reason for that is um, because bone is obviously a living substance. Now, as those little things obviously can happen to each and every one of us, right? On our way to work, when we do our sports, et cetera, et cetera, when we well, have a little bit of an argument with our neighbor, uh, we can become customers in no time, right? Now. What's the effect now? Suddenly, as I mentioned before, there is a joint where there shouldn't be one. There's an unplanned joint that simply cannot be controlled by tendons and ligaments, et cetera, et cetera. And this newly created joint, and this is now our job in osteosynthesis, this newly created joints needs to be completely eliminated. So we need to sort of uh, make it heal 
right? So it needs to be immobilized for, and now comes the point for a controlled healing. You want the limb to grow back to where it used to be in length and in angles, in rotation and in axis. Only when we manage actually to regain those, uh, those four factors, if you like, only then we come back to the desired function. Otherwise, certain things simply will not be possible. Either you cannot fully stretch or you cannot fully rotate and all those things that hinder you actually doing um, or doing the things that you like. All right. Now, what's that for you? What's that for us? It's basically customers we have to we have to talk about. And since we want to have happy customers, right? Not just we just don't want the idea of just whacking a piece of metal in someone, um, sort of uh, let them pay the bill and never see these guys again. The idea is actually to make people happy, to bring quality of life back. Now, bone fixation, osteosynthesis. Now. Bone fixation, obviously, or osteosynthesis is something that's happening automatically. So osteo means bone, synthesis means fusion. So it's an artificial kind of word. I think it came up from, from a French guy who uh, sort of uh, used this the first time about 100 or something years ago. And uh, But osteosynthesis, in actual fact, is something that happens naturally, right? Bone will grow back together unless the bone stems are not extremely far away from each other. Um, but what's the important thing is, is it actually growing back in the anatomically correct position, yes or no? And in modern osteosynthesis, this is exactly the purpose why we do this. Now, the necessity now for osteosynthesis is obviously, is obviously separation of bony tissue. And this have, can now have two different causes. So we can either have sort of these typical trauma things, accidents, and those leads generally to acute problems like fractures due to high energy, traffic, violence, falls, et cetera, et cetera. All those things that happen without uh, you having planned for it. Or we can talk about those elective surgery cases. These are so-called osteotomies where we artificially separate bony tissue with a chisel or a saw blade, whatever. And we usually, oops, we usually do this for cosmetic other cosmetic surgery, so um, to change the appearance of someone. Uh, but the main idea should actually be sort of functional reconstructive surgery. So when you have a malfunction, say your mandible is too short and you need to transport the whole mandible forward to make up, obviously, for the wrong occlusion, there you have to perform an osteotomy first, or when you have, we talk about foot surgery, when you have obviously a hallux valgus problem and you need to change the axis, uh, there you also have to perform an osteotomy and then screw everything back together with either a screw, a staple, whatever, anything that you have available. Right. Now, fracture patterns, if we just concentrate now on fractures, uh, depend now very much on the, obviously, magnitude of the force implied. Do we talk about high or low energy problems? The speed of um, uh, at the moment of impact. And this is now where the viscoelasticity of the material uh, plays a role. Muscle contraction plays a role. So am I falling just, am I fully drunk and I just fall and I have no possibility actually to put anything against the impact, then I will have a different fracture pattern compared to someone who is actually sort of already seeing what's happening and can actually react and absorb some of the energy by tightening the, the necessary muscles. Age of the patient plays a vital role, therefore bone morphology. Have I got an osteoporotic patient br with brittle bone? Have I got a young patient with elastic bone? Um, physical strength. So if you're a sporty guy, you have a different fracture pattern to someone who is rarely exercising with a couch potato. And last but not least, the direction of force, certainly. Am I, uh, am I subjected to bending, to massive shear, to torsion, to all those things? This also plays now a vital role if it comes to the fracture pattern. Now in mechanics, again, just to put you on the same page, mechanically speaking, we have five different stress modes. We have tensile stresses, so basically when you pull on something, we have compressional loads. And by the way, anything we talk about are subjected to those things. We have typically shear loads, we have torsional loads that you find, and uh, we have also bending. 
Now bending sort of represents a little bit of a, of a special case because bending actually sort of comprises of a tensile load on the outer part of a product. Uh, so you have a tensile side, whereas on the inner side of this beam, for instance, you would have a compressional load. So therefore, uh, when you bend this beam back and forth, this will always alternating compression, tension, compression, tension, if you go from left to right, which has then obviously a completely different aspect, again, when it comes to patterns. Fracture types, certainly we find um, they come, I don't want to say they come in all, in all shapes and sizes, but they come depending now very much, again, on the state of the patient, on the impact, you can have sort of incomplete fractures like those fissures that you see or these green stick fractures for young patients where you have a crack, but a crack that's not going all the way through. So you haven't got a full, a full separation. It's not sort of a bipart fracture. Bipart fractures or two-part fractures actually start with obliques or transversals or spirals where you really have a distal end and a proximal shaft or you have a mid-shaft problem, but you have basically from one beam, you make two. All right, but only with one fracture line. It's becoming way more severe, certainly, when we talk about comminuted fractures. Those are typically uh, high energy fractures or fractures of elderly people with very brittle bone, very osteoporotic bone that cannot absorb the energy fast enough. There you may end up then with these multi fragmented explosion fractures, right, where you have all bits and pieces flying about. Uh, those usually also lead to a dramatic, obviously, malposition of your limb. You have, an, you have a compression, so everything shortens and regaining then obviously length and keeping the distal end relative to the proximal end of your bone actually in anatomical position. This is then the hard part. Right, now sensitivity of bone. Bone as a material is very stable when it comes to compression, so you can actually put lots and lots of weight on slowly um, before the bone actually snaps. It's moderately stable when it comes to tension. So you cannot, you not, cannot uh, sort of pull that much on a bone, then you can actually compress it. And it's weakest in shear. So don't actually put your arm between a garage door and close it. Then obviously you end up very quickly with a fracture as shear is a weakness there. Now, Fracture patterns come in all shapes and sizes. Now, what you see there, this is sort of just a, a series of uh, CT scans. Um, those are, by the way, those are artificial fractures. Those I've just copied from um, an eyebrow course that we held in Cologne. And here we have sort of artificially produced fractures where the limb was actually held inside of a fracture machine. Every limb was actually held in exactly the same angle. We applied exactly the same energy in exactly the same amount of time. And although those limbs had a pretty similar age, they have always all, already be sort of above, say, 70, I think, you find that every specimen sort of created a different fracture pattern. And this is now what makes life relatively difficult from a surgical standpoint because every patient will have its individual fracture pattern depending on the energy applied, depending on the age, depending on whatever sports the person was actually doing. And those things make operations very unpredictable. We have to understand this. So it would be a beautiful thing to have just one implant that does all the tricks because all fractures are the same and all anatomies are the same, but this is not true. We have to understand that we have um, individual things. It's like a fingerprint in a way. And that's why we have to also react individually then to each of those fractures. That's just very quickly as they come, not just in all shapes and sizes, but they come obviously in all severities from extra articular, intra articular, simple complex, comminute, displaced, impressed fractures, malrotated ones, die punch ones where the whole uh, joint line is actually sort of impressed into the intramedullary canal. We have diaphyseal, metaphyseal fracture, and tons of them. And for all those, we have to have something in our heads that we have to draw out. Uh, in order to save the day, if you like. Now, history of bone repair, just very quickly, and obviously for, for, for always, humans have 
have been breaking their bones once in a while and uh, other humans actually became very inventive. It became to um, repairing those things, those problems. And you can actually see um, sort of typically when we talk about proper history of repair, it all started obviously already due to the Egyptians, they had palm twigs and stuff that they obviously sort of just um, have been used to support obviously fractures from, from externally. But if you go to Delachon in the, uh, in the 1600s, uh, then obviously Roger and Williams with um, obviously saclage constructs, then external fixators from Wutzer in, in, in Germany in, in 1843. And, and all those things have been developed over time. Now, the Big Bang, though, I have to say, actually started when the first um, sort of stainless materials have been available. You see, before that, you simply did not have the materials available to actually do the job internally. So there was always sort of the race between um, is the fracture healing fast enough or is the patient actually dying due to infection, right? And um, from the 20th century onwards, the whole thing just accelerated tremendously. So we saw then the first Kirschner wires, the Lombard fixator actually came, Reinhold um, sort of invented fixed angle products, um, Obviously, in the late 19th century, the first plate actually came out. And the Big Bang, though, and this is why this is highlighted here in red, was actually the foundation of the AO in Switzerland by Müller, Algöver, Willnegger, and Schneider. Uh, these guys actually obviously tried to find a recipe, if you like, for every fracture pattern to have a good, efficient bone repair to regain, obviously, the anatomical length and function. And this changed then everything. And then from there, things then sort of appeared like um, fixed angle devices, polyaxial angle devices from Volta, for instance, soft plate hard screw constructs. Then we saw uh, unidirectional constructs independent of material. Um, we, in, the, uh, in 2004, 2005, we introduced Trilog as a friction locking construct to the market. And all those things obviously appeared. And... This is then when we can talk about really modern uh, state of the art osteosynthesis. Now, coming back to the AO, now those AO principles certainly still apply today. And the, those are the four that are still sort of, that's what you need to know as, a, um, as an orthopedic surgeon. You need to be able to exactly anatomically reposition and reduce your fracture, hold it there, then fix the whole thing functionally stable or at least as stable so that the patient can actually perform post-operatively movements in order to free the joint lines so that the joint lines actually don't um, sort of become immobile over time. Vascularization is obviously key to everything. Bone is a living, a living substance. So therefore, if you stop a blood supply, bone will eventually die. So vascularization is, the most, is one of the most important things because otherwise you can only amputate. When, when the whole thing is simply not healing because there is no blood supply, then obviously uh, amputation is then the next step from there. And obviously to us, early active mobilization. So to make sure that the patient actually starts moving as quickly after the operation as possible. Now, Fixation plate principles, and obviously Metartis is a plate and screw manufacturer. That's why I would like to concentrate on plates and screws only, and I don't want to talk about intermediary things. So this is not, not really part of, of the session. We can do this at a later date. But if you look at the how a fixation plate actually works, you will find once you reduce your fracture and you screw your plate down onto the bone, and this is a so-called non-locking construct, so the screw is completely free to spin inside of the countersink as often as it wants. So when you tighten the screw, the screw heads will transport the plate all the way down to the surface of the bone, will therefore compress the plate onto the bone, which gives us then the fixation. But still, the screw is still completely free to move. The screw is still an individual item, if you like. And uh, that's why I usually refer to this as, um, as an item solution, all right? The plate is still a plate, the screw is still a screw. So you still you rely pretty much on the load sharing idea. So the bone takes a certain 
amount of the load, especially of compression loads of the plate, just makes sure that the fracture fragments cannot shift relative to one another. But the main flow of force goes really via the bone. Then as a further development to this, in the late 60s, compression plate technology was developed. So whenever you found it very difficult to obviously to close a fracture gap and to regain sort of what we call an interfragmentary compression, their compression plates became quite handy. So how this works, you screw a plate down on one side of the fracture, tighten those screws, and then you have certain holes on the opposite side that are not just ordinary holes, those are longitudinal slots. Longitudinal slots with a certain slope. So when you insert your screw head and the screw head makes contact, when you now fully tighten your screw, your screw with your plate will now transport the left part over to the right part. So when you fully seat your screw, then the gap gets fully closed, which also obviously accelerates, that's the, the theory behind that, also accelerates therefore bone healing. That's something that you still find, but uh, not that often anymore. And uh, again, load sharing principle. And we have for all those highly complex fractures, things that we simply cannot sort of address with individual screws. Um, we have, we refer to uh, those systems. So in this case, to describe this a little bit, um, a little bit more easily, I guess, we have to refer to the external fixator principle. So whenever you have a comminuted fracture, say of a distal radius, this could be any other bone, this could be an ankle. So we're just, just for the sake of, of showing you a typical example. Um, when you have a comminuted fracture, and you put now shunt screws into your metacarpals and shunt screws into the shaft of your radius, and you connect everything together with those bars and those brackets, and you tighten all those brackets, what you create now is a so-called external fixator. So therefore, the shunt screws via the bracket becomes part of the bar and vice versa. So if all brackets are fully tightened, this is a complete system that where all the components cannot move relative to one another anymore. So that's the nature of this. Now, the problem though, um, or put it this way, the beauty about this is now obviously that this is, this is taking over now the complete function and the, com the complete stabilization of the, um, of the bone. The compressional loads are now bypassing the completely fractured region, which means you end up with a completely uh, with, a, with a zone of reduced stresses. It's not completely load free because you have a certain flexibility of the construct, but you have reduced stresses, which means that those fragments can now heal in the well, more or less anatomical position. Having said that, it's very difficult to tell because you can only, you can only sort of estimate if they're in the right position because this is a closed kind of reduction intervention. So you squeeze those fragments just from the outside into the right position, hope that they're, that they're there where they belong to. And then you rely on the, on the lig on ligamentotaxis. So basically the ligaments uh, produce a, pon a constant uh, tensile load onto those fragments. And you can only hope that you haven't actually sort of put too much tension on the whole construct because otherwise you dislocate again everything. So it's not an easy thing to do, but it was a big step forward when it came to the repair of complex fractures. This was then obviously reduced in size as soon as the internal fix of the principle was introduced. And you have to imagine this is now the small version of the external fixator. While the external fixator obviously sticks out, the internal fixator can be hidden underneath your soft tissue. So it's basically, again, like a fixation plate, a plate and screw system, but the screw is actually locking on the level of the plate. So therefore, you're not locking outside of your patient, you're locking inside of your patient. Principle though, mechanically stays the same. Any kind of compressional load due to this fixed angle connections, those loads are now bypassing this region. And imagine worst case, you haven't got sort of a nice fracture that can distribute load or that can take load. Imagine you have a completely comminuted region here with tiny fragments flying about 
where any, any kind of compression would actually lead to a shortening of the whole construct, an internal fixator actually helps you there because the internal fixator makes sure that the, for, the force is actually bypassing this region. This completely fractured zone can actually heal without or with very little external influence. That's the beauty about this. Now, as the standard example, I always refer to the, uh, the typical dorsally displaced extension fracture of a distal radius, the most common fracture in the human body, by the way, that's why I always refer, very often refer to distal radius repair. Now in the distal radius repair, you have a massive um, comminuted zone on the, on the dorsal aspect, but you would like to actually plate the whole thing from volar because on the dorsal aspect, you have uh, very little room. You have tendons and stuff. So you, the, last, uh, the last thing you would like to see is actually metal work uh, on the dorsal side. So you always try to shift the plate whenever possible to the volar aspect. Now comes the fun part. Now, if now all those screws distally as well as proximally are locked, then any kind of compressional load that travels then via your radiocarpal joint will be transferred into what we call a bending moment. So wherever the screw head is actually locked inside of the plate, the compressional load is transferred into a bending moment. This bending moment travels then inside of your plate as, a, as bending energy, if you like, all right? And is then fed back via this cantilever system on both sides. Uh, and is fed back as an axial compressional load again, which means now that this whole region between the distal and the proximal screws is a zone of reduced stresses. So we only have very little load there that could potentially shorten or displace or change the angular orientation of our distal, uh, of the, of our distal radius joints. Right. Now this is a typical load bearing scenario. So the plate has to has full load during the complete healing time. Bone cannot take over anything at the moment. So all, all the, the loads that we find have to travel now via the metal work. So the, the plate is now mimicking basically the function of the healthy bone. Now the main stress mode and this is to me always important to say of fixed angle devices, therefore, is actually bending. So um, that's why you cannot just use any kind of fixation plate, put a locking hole inside and make it therefore a good locking product. We have to understand that in a, uh, in a fixed angle device, bending is, um, or the resistance against bending is actually what gives us anatomical reduction and anatomical reposition during the healing period. That's the important part to understand. Now, let me um, obviously uh, make you a little bit um, sort of thoughtful. I just put up two hypotheses. Hypothesis one, stability is obviously key to success in bone repair, as you've just learned. Hypothesis two, products fail because they are not strong enough. So therefore, our conclusion would need to be the stronger the construct, the better the product. This is usually what you find when you read, obviously, scientific articles and when they do these kind of comparative tests. So they test competitor A, B, C, and D. And whoever actually comes out strongest is usually the one who gets thumbs up and the weak stuff... Um, not, not even looked at. Now, is this really true? Is stronger necessarily better? I would say absolutely not. We need now to understand, uh, since the screw and plate construct, as it has to partly take over the function of bone, and therefore it has to take now in the region of bridging, it has to take now bending, shear, compression, tension, torsion, so everything that is usually applied to the end of the bone, this needs to travel now via your metal work into the, into the shaft. That's why we need to talk something that I would call adequate stability. So not ultimate stability should be the goal, but adequate stability. And going back to maybe the, remember the title of this presentation, as strong as, uh, as necessary and as weak as possible. So we don't want to make things overly strong. But we also don't want to make it too weak, but we need to know roughly 
what is adequate stability? How much force would we like to, um, to submit from one portion of bone to the other? And then we have obviously a good product. Now, getting a head around obviously all those plate systems that you find in the market, you find it's a true tsunami of osteosynthesis product, especially when we talk about distal radius repair. This is the worst thing because we, there is about 50 different companies out there, maybe, maybe more than that. And every company uh, obviously has an own philosophy. They have an own locking construct. Some rely on a soft plate and a hard screw, for instance. Others though um, are made of ultimately strong, super thick uh, metal, super high rigidity. Uh, others are just copies of others. They don't know what they do, but they just copy and sell it for a lot of money and all all those things you find and uh, the reason again why i've chosen actually distal rate is because this is the most confusing uh, portfolio that you actually find because it's very difficult to get your head around and obviously every company tries to tell you that their product is actually best uh, interestingly enough i'm trying to do exactly the same here all right now the blue plates that you see there, this is obviously, this is the Medartis portfolio. Uh, I will come to that a little bit later, but just to give you a certain understanding of um, how confusing it is actually choosing the right company and the right product, therefore. Now, just as a little teaser, because this will be part actually of session number two, but to already make a little bit of appetite, um, we have to differentiate now when it comes to the stability aspect do we have to do with static stability? So how many straws can you actually put on a camel's back before it eventually breaks? Is this important to us? So do we need to know when something breaks? Or is a dynamic stability more important? So therefore, how durable is it? How much cyclic loading can it actually survive? How many cycles and the amplitude, so the magnitude, of those, um, of those loading intervals. So the differentiation between the two, I think uh, is important because very often these load to failure kind of tests are just telling you something about the performance of, of metal, but it's not telling you anything about how the metal actually interacts with the surrounding bony tissue. And this is where the, where the important part is. Come to the point stiffness. Now, stiffness is a super important parameter of materials and structures generally. And um, it pretty much determines, first of all, how much an object deforms under load. That's number one when it comes to stiffness, but also how an object shares or transfers loads to other materials. So therefore, it's a huge difference if something is rock solid or if something can actually flex under load, like a tree in the wind. If you have a tree that simply cannot move, a massive, uh, a massive wind will eventually sort of break it. If you, though, you have a tree that is flexible, that can actually bend and flex, the likelihood of this thing surviving a storm is, very, is, is much, much higher. And here we have exactly the same thing. It always depends on how you transfer now the load into the other material. So basically how you how you actually um, sort of transfer the whole thing. Now, so the relevance of stiffness in internal fixation depends now very much whether the product will actually experience, experience significant mechanical loads, tension, compression, torsion, etc. whether its performance will be therefore affected by the amount of deformation. So are we still staying in the elastic deformation mode or are we already in the plastic deformation mode? Do we have a permanent deformation? Permanent deformation would actually mean we have a permanent loss of reduction. That's not what we want. If something though flexes under load and springs back, then uh, deformation is not that much of a problem. It's actually something that is wanted. And thirdly, how the load can be shared now between the implant material and the bone to be stabilized, all right? Now, when it comes now to selecting, um, uh, obviously, uh, a material uh, for bone repair, we have to take certain uh, things into consideration. We have, first of all, 
whenever we design, we have clinical con considerations. So what kind of material can we use? Biocompatible, need, need to be tissue friendly, surgical access needs to be simple, patient comfort plays a super, a super important role. Geometrical uh, consideration, certainly, we have to have anatomical fit, ideally, the width, therefore, the length plays a role, the thickness, the profile height, you cannot just make it ultimately thick, because then suddenly, your soft tissues don't actually run smoothly over the surface. And <clears throat> we need to understand the mechanical considerations, how much strength is required, how much stiffness, how much elasticity do we want, what kind of locking type can we actually um, sort of create or inserts into this product. All those things are important. Now, when it comes to mechanical considerations, um, we uh, have certain parameters that we find, but just coming back to um, anatomical fit and coming also back to the selection of implants. Now, people are usually uh, confused by the amount of products a system actually comprises of. Now, the idea is actually for a good implant system to sort of have a solution for pretty much everything. So we want to be able to fix simple fractures, extra articular stuff, to moderate intra-articular, to shaft fractures. And a good system, therefore, has to have sort of a repair method for anything that can potentially occur. If you only sort of take... 70% of all the fractures that you can cover, you will always have a patient that you simply cannot treat because either the, com the, the fracture is too complex or the repair method is too expensive for the simple one. So therefore, a good system has to have pretty much everything. So completeness in that instance is actually um, sort of the, uh, the key to success because you want to cover the whole range of indications. Now, Material parameters, I was mentioning before, as this is important uh, when it comes to um, how thin, for instance, you can actually make a product. Um, any, if you want to choose a material, you will find every material has specific properties. This can be chemic, uh, chemical properties, magnetic, manufacturing properties, mechanical properties. And amongst mechanical properties, and I just let this fly through the, because it would be too time consuming actually to go into everything. This gives you an idea of what mechanical properties actually mean. This is all connected directly to mechanical properties of materials. So this is what we need to consider when we choose a material that is suitable for a new problem, if you like. Now, <clears throat> at a certain point, a manufacturer has to figure out what, what do I want? How do I want to fix this? Do I want to use metalwork? Do you want to use maybe plastics? And if I go say, I want, I've, choose, I've chosen metals, what do I want? Do I want stainless steel? Do you want cobalt chrome? Do you want titanium or titanium alloys, magnesium alloy maybe, something that, I don't know, dissolves inside of a patient after a while and creates maybe other problems, we don't know, right? Or can I, are the forces low? So therefore, can I maybe do the whole thing with a plastic implant? Um, all those things you need to figure out. Now in osteosynthesis, as we know it, uh, long bone osteosynthesis, but also osteosynthesis where you need to have extremely low profile heights. So therefore screw head inside of plate hole as thin as you can possibly go in order not to, um, to disturb the function of your gliding tissue. There's usually no way around metals, to be honest with you. If you try to, to put a piece of plastic, a plastic plate inside of a finger, the whole thing is usually way too bulky, way too big. You can certainly stabilize the fracture, but you cannot uh, regain function. That's simply not working, all right? Which has to do obviously with the mechanical uh, stability, the tensile stability of, um, of material. Now, prerequisites when you choose metals is obviously you need to have something that is stainless, rust-free, needs to be biocompatible, long-term implantable, ideally flexible and elastic, ductile if you want to change the shape, malleable, and ideally non-magnetic if you want to MRI your patient. If you have a steel implant, for instance, you always get artifacts and maybe you cannot really make use of that. So therefore, for us, non-magnetic was an important thing. That's why we, as MedArtis, we have decided already in the very early days, some 20 something years ago, to go for titanium as the preferred implant material, but because to us, it's a miracle material. It has an extremely high tensile strength. 
or it can have an extremely high tensor strength. Um, it's perfectly biocompatible. So um, there is not, as I know of, a single case reported so far, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong here, um, of someone with a titanium allergy. So in that respect, we're perfectly safe there. Now, the standard understanding, titanium is a metal with a certain property. Now, not quite, you see. When we talk about titanium, we have four different com commercially pure titanium grades available where we can actually choose from soft stuff, pretty tough stuff, or we have also 50 titanium alloys of which only two or three can actually be used for biomedical use. And um, so we have these pure titaniums. They come in four different grades from one to four. And as I mentioned before, we have those two titaniums like titanium aluminum vanadium, titanium niobium, um, for instance, when it comes for screw manufacturing, because you want to have a to, to be the screw to be as thin as you can possibly go, right? That's why you want to have a material that has a very high tensile strength. Now, commercially pure titanium is obviously called commercially pure titanium because it comprises nearly 200% of titanium. Having said that, grade one to say grade four, there is a tiny difference, obviously a tiny balance uh, when it comes to certain uh, certain elements like nitrogen, for instance, changes slightly from grade one to grade uh, four. Carbon stays pretty much the same. Same goes for hydrogen. Iron, the iron content changes slightly. Again, this does not change anything on the biocompatibility aspect. And oxygen is actually, so the higher the grade, the more oxygen you actually have inside, titanium oxide. Right, um, but still, this is commercially pure titanium. And then next to that, we have like titanium aluminum vanadium. That's the material that we are using, for instance, for screws. Um, this comes then with obviously not just traces of aluminium, but proper 6% of aluminium and 4% of uh, vanadium. Now, why is this? Adding those extra metals, obviously, uh, to the titanium base sort of changes the mechanical stability of a product. So the, the grid structure of the metal changes, hence you have a much higher tensile strength. Now, since titanium is soft and malleable, but also rigid and flexible, uh, we have to look a little bit at the, uh, at the tensile strength and the effect that the chemical composition actually, actually has on this. Now, going from grade one to grade four, you can also see now that the higher the grade, the higher the tensile strength. So this 240 megapascal is equivalent to about 24 kilograms of tensile load per square millimeter of material. So we have a wire with a millimeter diameter. It could actually lift 24 kilos. If it would be made of titanium grade four, then it would be 55 kilos. And uh, it's even, even more performing or performing way better. If you go to titanium, aluminum, vanadium, there you already have 86 kilograms that you could potentially lift. Now, the effect that this has now, obviously on a product. Now, when we look at say, for instance, a screw, and this just as an example, this is a two millimeter bone screw with a two millimeter outer diameter, a core diameter of 1.5. So therefore a cross-sectional area of the screw of about 1.8 square millimeters. So this screw would be able to lift about 43 kilos. If this screw though is made of titanium grade four, it can already bear 99 kilos. And if we use the stuff that we are using, titanium, aluminum, vanadium, then obviously not surprising, it already takes 155 kilos, so nearly four times as much as commercially pure titanium grade one. So therefore, when, you, when you're asking yourself, uh, oh, this, this, this manufacturer produces a titanium implant, you always need to ask the question, which kind of titanium is actually used to give you a proper answer? And if we take these 155 kilos as, a, as our standard, so basically as a dimensional change about a constant load, so, a 2.0 millimeter screw of titanium aluminum vanadium can lift 155. If it would be made of titanium grade four, it already would have an OD of 2.5 millimeter, so half a millimeter more. And if it would be made, no one would do this, but if it would be made of titanium grade one, it would already be a 3.5 millimeter screw. So to tell you the 
influence of why the choosing the right titanium grade is ever so important. Now, this is just now the aspect of tensile strength. Now, tensile strength is obviously the basis of calculating now bending. Now, as we've already reached um, 8.55, right? And I would love to stay below one hour with this webinar. This is the point where I would like to obviously stop, but also to make you a little bit of appetite what's actually coming in the next session is actually um, how we calculate those bending moments. So therefore, is it a difference if we use a soft material for a plate or is it a difference if you use a tough material for a stabilizing thing? And so therefore, the maximum allowed stress when choosing the implant material and the other thing is what we call the so-called section modulus. Section modulus describes now how, which kind of geometry would you like to have in order to give you the best possible distribution of bending loads, so the thinnest possible product with the highest possible performance. But this is something for the next session. And uh, with this, I would just like to come to an end for today. So thanks very much for your attention. I know this is lots of information. I hope it was not too boring. And I would, I would love, obviously, I would love to, to see you next week again. So for Biomechanics 2, where I would try to close the loop um, in terms of what effect does now the stability of the product has when we compare now the different manufacturers to one another. Is ultimate stability really bad or is flexibility really good? So what do we want? All this will be covered next week. Also a little bit of information about various locking constructs. So if you would like to join me, please do so. Thanks very much for your attention. I really appreciate that you spend an hour with me and uh, stay safe, stay healthy. And uh, now you would have the possibility to ask questions to Mr. Walter. That's what it said actually on those slides before. So feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. If you, if things are not popping up immediately, you also have certainly the possibility to send, uh, to send me an email with your questions. And maybe in session number two, I could uh, refer to those questions. My address is actually matthias.walter at medartis.com m-a-t-t-h-i-a-s dot w-a-l-t-e-r at medartis.com all right so i just need to ask alexander are there any questions so far there are annealed in terms of heat treated uh, we don't anneal our titanium at all. So um, annealing obviously is changing the properties of the material. So, so therefore, if you heat it up above a certain, uh, a certain degree, it will change its tensile strength. That's whenever we machine our products, we make sure that we hardly go above room temperature. So maybe the cooling, uh, the cooling agents that we are using sort of are usually 28, maybe 30 degrees maximum. But apart from that, we always try to do everything at room temperature. The only time I can really remember, but this is a product that does not exist anymore, when we had an extremely harsh bending radius, right? So if you would have cold bent this radius, then we would have uh, induced micro cracks in the surface. This was one of the reasons why we heated it up to, I think it was uh, in the region of 350 degrees to make it a little bit more ductile. But this product is not available anymore. So therefore, uh, none of the existing products uh, is actually annealed, at least not to, to my knowledge. Um, if we call it heat treatment, so we could certainly a thermal disinfection. So when we talk about now autoclaving a product at 134 degrees, 134 degrees is still uh, sort of below a temperature that could potentially change the mechanical property of the material. So you could obviously heat the material up and down, so autoclave, 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 but you would not actually find a difference in um, in tensile strength, for instance. Um, that's something that, that I know of. Uh, happy with that? Is, was this answering your question, hopefully? 
Any anything else? Anyone else? Okay. Now it took me exactly sixty one minutes actually to come to this point. Thank once again. Thanks very much. And uh, with this, I would just like to wish you a very nice day or a nice evening, depending where you live. And uh, stay safe. Don't let Corona actually sort of mess with you and your family. Um, I'm sitting. By, by the way, I'm sitting actually in my in my kitchen at the moment, all right? All right, together with Alexander, we have a pretty good time here. So um, please, therefore, join us again next week for Biomechanics number two.